It's not uncommon to hear people compare the modern Western world to the late Roman Empire. I've heard many times of its decadence, and how it's similar to ours, and how we're headed in the same direction as they were 1800 years ago. I've always assumed that caricature is more or less accurate, and hadn't much questioned it, until I read Peter Brown's Body and Society. This book explores the Mediterranean world during late antiquity, particularly the radical culture of sexual renunciation in the sect of Christianity. Brown, in his exposition of the culture in which Christianity spent its first centuries, is careful not to smuggle in modern assumptions about humanity, but instead makes it clear that the world we're looking back on is first and foremost a strange one. The society is markedly different from our society. Its assumptions couldn't be further away from ours today. This is particularly true when considering the most important question of all, indeed the question at the core of every human society. What does it mean to be human? As we travel through Syria, Egypt, Anatolia, and Italy of late antiquity, we will come into contact with different approaches to this question from different thinkers and different approaches to addressing other tertiary questions such as what does it mean to be male, or what does it mean to be female, and what are the main problems that society needs to redress. Over the course of this series, we will be exploring body and society. It features character studies on some of the foremost thought leaders in the ascetic movement from different parts of the Mediterranean world. But first we're going to look at Roman society itself during the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. The Greco-Roman culture of late antiquity had a wholly different view of the human body from ours today. One of the key differences in their environment was this, they were a society surrounded by death. Life was a much more fragile and fleeting thing back then, and they were wont to barricade the society against the threat of death. This ever-present reality had a profound effect on how they approached structure and authority. To make this more concrete, the life expectancy we've been able to discern from this period is about 25 years. While there were of course many living well beyond that age, when it came to the plebiscite, there's little doubt that the bulk of them died very, very young. Child mortality was also unbelievably common, and in order to maintain the population, each woman in the society would need to bear at least five children during her lifetime. This meant that a woman would usually be married off and starting to bear children as soon as she was physically capable of it. There's one exception to this rule in the form of the religious virgin, as we see in the Christian ascetic movement, but this was very uncommon, and many of these religious virgins would actually have children later in life, around the time they reached 30. If you were a woman, and not one of the select few, your mandate was to reproduce, usually starting at the time you were 14. The society saw the bodies of women as imperfect and inferior to men's, but necessary for bearing children. There was an idea about a kind of heat that's in the bodies of men, which enabled them to be strong and self-controlled. This is to be contrasted with a kind of dampness that was found in the bodies of women. It was important that men acted manly and made sure not to adopt womenly characteristics. Men were expected to act in all calmness, and to be well composed and rational. It was thus looked down upon for male slave owners to use physical violence against their slaves. Women, in the eyes of the society, were given to passions of the flesh and to sexual looseness, and they needed to be reined in by their husbands, and trained in the composition of men. Despite this, some women ended up in positions of power. A wife would be the ruler of the household when her husband traveled. Moreover, it was thought that a wife could be relied on completely in matters of honesty, a safe haven for the husband whose male political colleagues were potentially deceitful. In this, we see husbands and wives of high society being able to work together towards common goals. Greco-Roman society also had its uses for celibacy. It was sometimes recommended for athletes and lawyers, 
men who needed to focus completely on their trade and would only be distracted by the passions of the flesh. Sex itself was viewed as an outburst of passion, not wholly unlike fits of rage. It was thought that the manner in which one engaged in the sexual act would determine the temperament of the children produced from the sex. In short, they believed that angry sex would produce angry children, passionate sex, passionate children, and so on and so forth. This sort of behavior went up against the prescriptions of the culture. The spirit of the age was self-control and restraint. How could society be regimented and thus propagated if the man could not regiment his own body? The Stoics condemned the idea of sex for pleasure. As we'll see throughout the remainder of this book, there weren't actually very many thinkers in late antiquity who promoted the idea of sex as a means of pleasure. This attitude towards sex is not unlike that of fundamentalist Muslims today. This is to be contrasted with our modern assumptions of late Roman decadence, the cliché of the Roman party with endless feasting, vomiting, and orgies simply isn't an accurate representation of the society. Now none of this is to say that the male heads of households were expected to exercise sexual restraint within their households. And note that we're speaking of households, not just families. A family is limited to blood relatives, but a household would include servants and slaves of every type who contributed to the operations of the household. And the male heads had every right to use sex to express his domination over the household. In the sexual act itself, penetration was the symbol of dominance. A man who had sexual desire for a male servant in his household was not in any way disturbing to the culture. What, what was disturbing was the idea that a man who was ruling over a household would play the woman and allow himself to be penetrated by his inferior. This kind of behavior threatened to upset this carefully maintained structure of society and was so unacceptable. The late Roman Empire believed very strongly in the soul needing to be over the body, just as it believed in the man being over the household. Greek philosophers taught that one must rein in and subject the body, with all its desires, to the mind or to the soul. The soul was to exercise a type of gentle violence on the body. Again, contrary to what we usually hear about the period, the gluttonous and drunkardly behavior was very much frowned upon. Now, when it comes to women, none of the hardships of women as wives and mothers in their households were paid attention to by the city. It was the Christians who made much of such hardships and began pointing them out. This is one of the ways in which Christianity started the process of transforming society. While Roman society exerted much control over women, it wasn't unheard of for a young girl to be sexually loose. This was certainly not the ideal, and it could be interpreted as a bad omen for the family, but a girl who was deflowered before marriage wasn't a disgrace to the family, just somewhat out of line. The most helpless casualty of the society was the newborn infant. It was customary for the father to lift up a baby when it was born. In doing this, he attributed humanity to the child. The father could, however, refrain, and the baby would be left to die. This could be for reasons of physical mutations on the child's body, or even for reasons of the child's gender. Contrasted with the structure-obsessed, generational-propagation-focused mainstream society, the Christians would have appeared disturbingly radical in their views on the body. Clement of Alexandria, who lived from 150 AD to 215 AD, was a church father who taught that Christians ought not to experience desire at all, but rather strain towards the transformation of the body. Part of this straining was sexual renunciation. Some Christians came to believe that they could take part in Christ's victory through re renunciation. An end to marriage and childbirth would knock out the supports of organized society which could at last crumble and be replaced by an eternal kingdom ruled by Christ. <laughs>